All right, did not get anything started, but I do have time to get another episode knocked out. So we're gonna get that done. Uh, how do they have these? It's volume one, V1, chapter one. They have it for some reason um, in volumes. My guess would be that oh, no. um, it was originally released in three volumes, which happens. How do I say continuing? Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. Listeners like you. All of the links for our show are in the show notes. Today we'll be taking a new bite of Emma by Jane Austen. Austen. Volume 1, Chapter 1. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy dispositioned, dispositioned? Oh my god. <clears throat> Sometimes this happens. Austin. Volume 1, Chapter 1. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, disposition. seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex, her. or vex her. She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate, indulgent father, and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from a very early period. A period. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses. caresses. And her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as governess who had fallen little short of a mother in affection. In affection. Sixteen years had Miss Taylor been in Mr. Woodhouse's family, less as a governess than a friend, very fond of both daughters, but particularly of Emma. The of Emma. Between them, it was more the intimacy of sisters. Sisters. Even before Miss Taylor had ceased to hold the nominal office of governess, the mildness of her temper had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint. A restraint. And the shadow of authority being now long passed away, they had been living together as friend and friend very mutually attached, and Emma doing just what she liked. What she liked. Highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but directly... Directly. What she liked highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but directed chiefly by her own. By her own. The real evils indeed of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much her own way and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. Of herself. These were the disadvantages which threatened... Of herself. These were the disadvantages which threatened alloy to her many enjoyments. The danger, however, was at present so unperceived that they did not by any means rank as misfortunes with her. With her. Sorrow came. A gentle sorrow, but not at all in the shape of any disagreeable consciousness. Consciousness. Miss Taylor married. Consciousness. Miss Taylor married. It was Miss Taylor's loss which first brought grief. Brought grief. It was on the wedding day of this beloved friend that Emma first sat in mournful thought of any continuance. continuance. The wedding over and the bride people gone, her father and herself were left to dine together, dine together. with no prospect of a third to cheer a long evening. long evening. Her father composed himself to sleep after dinner, as usual, and she had then only to sit and think of what she had lost. The event had every promise of happiness for her friend. For her friend. Mr. Weston was a man of unexceptional character, easy fortune, suitable age, and pleasant manners. Pleasant manners. And there was some satisfaction in considering with what self-denying, generous friendship she had always wished and promoted the match. The match. 
but it was a black morning's work for her. Work for her. The want of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. Every day. She recalled her past kindness. The kindness, the affection of 16 years. 16 years. How she had taught and how she had played with her from five years old. Five years old. How she had devoted all her powers to attach and amuse her in health. Her in health. And how nursed her through the various illnesses of childhood. Childhood. A large debt of gratitude was owing here. But the intercourse of the last seven years, the equal footing and perfect unreserve which had soon followed Isabella's marriage on their being left to each other, to each other. was yet a dearer, tenderer recollection. Recollection. She had been a friend and companion such as few possessed. Intelligent, well-informed, useful, gentle, knowing all the ways of the family. The family. Interested in all its concerns and peculiarly interested in herself in every pleasure, every scheme of hers. Scheme of hers. One to whom she could speak every thought as it arose and who had such an affection for her as could never find fault. And fault. How was she to bear the change? It was true that her friend was only, uh. And fault. How was she to bear the change? The change. It was true that her friend was going only half a mile from them, but Emma was aware that great must be the difference between a Mrs. Weston, only half a mile from them, and a Miss Taylor in the house. In the house. And with all her advantages, natural and domestic, she was now in great danger of suffering from intellectual solitude. Solitude. She dearly loved her father, but he was no companion for her. He could not meet her in conversation, rational or playful. Playful. The evil of actual disparity in their ages, and Mr. Woodhouse had not married early, was much increased by his constitution and habits. And habits. For having been of a led... The Ledudinarian and habits for having been a valeted valet Leodinarian. Oops, and habits for having been a Leodinarian all his life without activity of mind or body. He was a much older man in ways than in years. In years. And though everywhere beloved for their fr in years, and though everywhere beloved for the friendliness of his heart and his amiable temper, his talents could not have recommended him at any time. At any time, her sister, though comparatively but little removed by matrimony, being settled in London, only sixteen miles off, miles off, was much beyond her daily reach. And many a long October and November evening must be struggled through at Hartfield. At Hartfield. Before Christmas brought the next visit from Isabella and her husband and their little children to fill the house and give her pleasant society again. Society again. Highbury. The large and populous village, almost amounting to a town to which Hartfield, in spite of its separate lawn and shrubberies and name, did really belong, really belong. afforded her no equals. The wood houses were first in consequence there. consequence there. All looked up to them. Up to them. She had many acquaintance in the place, for her father was universally civil, but not one among them who could be accepted in lieu of Miss Taylor for even half a day. Half a day. It was a melancholy change, and Emma could not but sigh over it and wish for impossible things till her father awoke and made it necessary to be cheerful. To be cheerful. His spirits required support. Support. He was a nervous man, easily depressed, fond of everybody that he was used to, and hating to part with them, hating change of every kind. Every kind. Matrimony, as the origin of change, was always disagreeable, and he was by no means yet reconciled to his own daughter's marrying, nor could ever speak of her but with compassion, though it had been entirely a match of affection. Of affection. When he was now obliged to part with Miss Taylor, too, and from his habits of gentle selfishness, and of being never able to suppose that other people could feel differently from himself, from himself. He was very much disposed to think Miss Taylor had done as sad a thing for herself as for them. 
as for them. And would have been a great deal happier if she had spent all the rest of her life at Hartfield. At Hartfield. Emma smiled and chatted at ch At Hartfield. Emma smiled and chatted as cheerfully as she could to keep him from such thoughts, but when tea came, it was impossible for him not to say exactly as he had said at dinner. Said at dinner. Poor Miss Taylor, I wish she were here again. What a pity it is that Mr. Weston ever thought of her. Ever thought of her. I cannot agree with you, Papa. You know I cannot. I cannot. Mr. Weston is such a good-humored, pleasant, excellent man that he thoroughly deserves a good wife. And you would not have had Miss Taylor live with us forever and bear all my odd humors when she might have a house of her own. House of her own. A house of her own. But where is the advantage of a house of her own? This is three times as large, and you have never any odd humors, my dear. Humors, my dear. How often we shall be going to see them and they coming to see us. We shall be always meeting. We must begin. We must go and pay wedding visit very soon. Very soon. My dear, how am I to get so far? Randall's is such a distance. I could not walk half so far. Half so far. No, Papa, nobody thought of your walking. We must go in the carriage to be sure. To be sure. The carriage, but James will not like to put the horses to for such a little way. And where are the poor horses to be while we are paying our visits? Paying our visits. They are to be put into Mr. Weston's stable, Papa. Stable, Papa. You know we have settled all that already. We talked it all over with Mr. Weston last night. Last night. And as for James, you may be very sure he will always like going to Randall's because of his daughter's being housemaid there. Housemaid there. I only doubt whether he will ever take us anywhere else. That was your doing, Papa. You got Hannah that good place. Good place. Nobody thought of Hannah till you mentioned her. James is so obliged to you. You. I'm very glad I did think of her. It was very lucky, for I would not have had poor James think himself slighted upon any account. Any account. And I am sure she will make a very good servant. She is a civil, pretty spoken girl. Spoken girl. I have a great opinion of her. Whenever I see her, she always curtsies and asks me how I do in a very pretty manner. Pretty manner. And when you have had her here to do needlework, I observe she always turns the lock of the door the right way and never bangs it. Bangs it. I am sure she will be an excellent servant, and it will be a great comfort to poor Miss Taylor to have somebody about her that she is used to see. Used to see. Whenever James goes over to see his daughter, you know, she will be hearing of us. He will be able to tell her how we all are. We all are. Emma spared no exertions to maintain this happier flow of ideas and hoped by the help of backgammon to get her father tolerably through the evening, through the evening, and be attacked by no regrets but her own. The backgammon table was placed, but a visitor immediately afterwards walked in and made it unnecessary. Necessary. Mr. Knightley, a sensible man about seven or eight and thirty, was not only a very old and intimate friend of the family, but particularly connected with it, as the elder brother of Isabella's husband. Husband. He lived about a mile from Highbury, was a frequent visitor, and always welcome, and at this time more welcome than usual as coming directly from their mutual connections in London. In London. He had returned to a late dinner after some day's absence and now walked up to Hartfield to say that all were well in Brunswick Square. Brunswick Square. It was a happy circumstance and animated Mr. Woodhouse for some time. For some time. Mr. Knightley had a cheerful manner, which always did him good, and his many inquiries after poor Isabella and her children were answer answered. For some time. Mr. Knightley had a cheerful manner, which always did him good, and his many inquiries after poor Isabella and her children were answered most satisfactorily. Satisfactorily. When this was over, Mr. Woodhouse gratefully observed. It is very kind of you, Mr. Knightley, to come out at this late hour to call upon us. I am afraid you must have had a shocking walk. Shocking walk? Not at all, sir. It is a beautiful moonlight night, and so mild that I must draw back from your great fire. Your great fire? But you must have found it very damp and dirty. I wish you may not catch cold. Catch cold? Dirty, sir. Look at my shoes. Not a speck on them. Speck on them? 
well. That is quite surprising, for we have had a vast deal of rain here. It rained dreadfully hard for half an hour while we were at breakfast. I wanted them to put off the wedding. Put off the wedding. By the by, I have not wished you joy. Being pretty well aware of what sort of joy you must both be feeling, I have been in no hurry with my congratulations. Congratulations. But I hope it all went off tolerably well. How did you all behave? Who cried most? Cried most. Ah, uh, poor Miss Taylor, tis a sad business. Sad business. Poor Mr. and Miss Woodhouse, if you please. Sad business. Poor Mr. and Miss... Sad business. Poor Mr. and Miss Woodhouse, if you please, but I cannot possibly say poor Miss Taylor. I have a great regard for you and Emma, but when it comes to the question of dependence or independence... Independence. At any rate, it must be better to have only one to please than two. Please than two. Especially when one of those two is such a fanciful, troublesome creature, said Emma playfully. Emma playfully. That is what you have in your head, I know, and what you would certainly say if my father were not by. Were not by. I believe it is very true, my dear, indeed, said Mr. Woodhouse with a sigh. I am afraid I am sometimes very fanciful and troublesome. Some. My dearest papa, you do not think I could mean you, or suppose Mr. Knightley to mean you. What a horrible idea. Horrible idea. Oh no, I meant only myself. Mr. Knightley loves to find fault with me, you know, in a joke. It is all a joke. We always say what we like to one another. To one another. Mr. Knightley, in fact, was one of the few people who could see faults in Emma Woodhouse, and the only one who ever told her of them. Told her of them. And though this was not particularly agreeable to Emma herself, told her of them. And though this was not particularly agreeable to Emma herself, she knew it would be so much less so to her father that she would not have him really suspect such a circumstance as her not being thought perfect by everybody. By everybody. Emma knows I never flatter her, said Mr. Knightley, but I meant no reflection on anybody. Miss Taylor has been used to have two persons to please. She will now have but one. The chances are that she must be a gainer. To be a gainer. Well, said Emma, willing to let it pass. You want to hear about the wedding, and I shall be happy to tell you, for we all behaved charmingly. Charmingly. Everybody was punctual. Everybody in their best looks. Not a tear, and hardly a long face to be seen. To be seen. Oh no, we all felt that we were going to be only half a mile apart and were sure of meeting every day every day. Dear Emma bears everything so well, said her father. But Mr. Knightley, she is really very sorry to lose poor Miss Taylor, and I am sure she will miss her more than she thinks for. Thinks for. Emma turned away. Uh. Thinks for. Emma turned away her head, divided between tears and smiles. It is impossible that Emma should not miss such a companion, said Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. We should not like her so well as we do, sir, if we could suppose it, but she knows how much the marriage is to Miss Taylor's advantage. Advantage. She knows how very acceptable it must be at Miss Taylor's time of life to be settled in a home of her own and how important to her to be secure of a comfortable provision. Comfortable provision. And therefore cannot allow herself to feel... Mm, comfortable provision. And therefore cannot allow herself to feel so much pain as pleasure. Pain as pleasure. Every friend of Miss Taylor must be glad to have her so happily married. Happily married. And you have forgotten one matter of joy to me, said Emma, and a very considerable one, that I made the match myself. Match myself. I made the match, you know, four years ago, and to have it take place and be proved in the right when so many people said Mr. Weston would never marry again may comfort me for anything. For anything. Mr. Knightley shook his head at her. Her father fondly replied, Ah, oh, my dear, I wish you would not make matches and foretell things. Foretell oh, things. For whatever you say always comes to pass. Pray do not make any more matches. Matches. I promise you to make none for myself, Papa, but I must indeed for other people. Other people. It is the greatest amusement in the world. And after such six... <laughs> in the world. And after such success, you know, everybody said that Mr. Weston would never marry again. Marry again. 
Oh dear, no, Mr. Weston, who had been a widower so long and who seemed so perfectly comfortable without a wife, so constantly occupied either in his business in town or among his friends here, friends here. always acceptable wherever he went, always cheerful. Mr. Weston need not spend a single evening in the year alone if he did not like it. Not like it. Oh no, Mr. Weston certainly would never marry again. Some people even talked of a promise to his wife on her deathbed. Her deathbed. And others of the son and the uncle not letting him. All manner of solemn nonsense was talked on the subject, but I believed none of it. None of it. Ever since the day, about four years ago, that Miss Taylor and I met with him in Broadway Lane, when, because it began to drizzle, he darted away with so much gallantry and borrowed two umbrellas for us from Farmer Mitchell's. For Mitchell's. I made up my mind on the subject. I planned the match from that hour, and when such success has blessed me in this instance, dear Papa, you cannot think that I shall leave off matchmaking. Matchmaking. I do not understand what you mean by success, said Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. Success supposes endeavor. Your time has been properly and delicately spent if you have been endeavoring for the last four years to bring about this marriage. This marriage. A worthy employment for a young lady's mind. Lady's mind. But if, which I rather imagine you're making the match as you call it, means only you're planning it, you're saying to yourself one idle day, I think it would be a very good thing for Miss Taylor if Mr. Weston were to marry her. Or to marry her. And saying it again to yourself every... Mm. Or to marry her. And saying it again to yourself every... Or to marry her. And saying it again to yourself every now and then afterwards. Why do you talk of success? Where is your merit? What are you proud of? You made a lucky guess, and that is all that can be said. Can be said. And have you never known the pleasure and triumph of a lucky guess? I pity you. I thought you cleverer, for depend upon it a lucky guess is never merely luck. Merely luck. There is always some talent in it. And as to my poor word success, which you quarrel with, I do not know that I am so entirely without any claim to it. Claim to it. You have drawn two pretty pictures, but I think there may be a third. A something between the do-nothing and the do-all. The do-all. If I had not promoted Mr. Weston's visits here and given many little encouragements and smoothed many little matters, it might not have come to anything after all. I think you must know Hartfield enough to comprehend that. And that. A straightforward, open-hearted man like Weston and a rational, unaffected woman like Miss Taylor may be safely left to manage their own concerns. The concerns. You are more likely to have done harm to yourself than good to them by interference. Interference. Emma never thinks of herself if she can do good to others, rejoined Mr. Woodhouse, understanding but in part. In part. But my dear, pray do not make any more matches. They are silly things and break up one's family circle grievously. Grievously. Only one more, Papa. Only for Mr. Elton. Poor Mr. Elton. You like Mr. Elton, Papa. I must look about for a wife for him. A wife for him. There is nobody in Highbury who deserves him, and he has been here a whole year and has fitted up his house so comfortably that it would be a shame to have him single any longer. Any longer. And I thought when he was joining their hands today, he looked so very much as if he would like to have the same kind office done for him. It's done for him. I think very well of Mr. Elton, and this is the only way I have of doing him a service. I'm a service. Mr. Elton is a very pretty young man, to be sure, and a very good young man, and I have a great regard for him. Regard for him. But if you want to show him any attention, my dear, ask him to come and dine with us some day. That will be a much better thing. I dare say Mr. Knightley will be so kind as to meet him. As to meet him. With a great deal of pleasure, sir, at any time, said Mr. Knightley, laughing. And I agree with you entirely that it will be a much better thing. Much better thing. Invite him to dinner, Emma, and help him to the best of the fish and the chicken, but leave him to choose his own wife. Depend upon it, a man of six or seven and twenty can take care of himself. himself. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. All of the links for our show are in the show notes. Show notes. 
We are part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you ever wondered what inspired your favorite classic novelists to write their stories, what was happening in their lives or the world at the time, check out Bite at a Time Books behind the story. Tuesdays, wherever you listen to podcasts. Again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow while we take the next bite of Emma. Cool, that's annoying. All right, that is it. It is food. Thanks, guys.